Would you turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Ezekiel chapter 37. Now I know some of you were just itching and dying to be in Deuteronomy this morning. It'll start next week. As you're turning, it's the first Sunday of 2024. After a year of activity and busyness and commotion and distress, it's nice to have a new year. I love a new year. I get a new Bible reading plan. I get a new planner. Everything is new. It's a new start. Thus, it has become customary for me to preach a sermon at the beginning of the year to orient us toward that driving focus of this church for 2024. Where are we going? Where are we going? I want to answer it through the question that God asked Ezekiel. So we'll say our sermon in a question. Can these dry bones live? Can these dry bones live? Let's pray. We'll read our passage. Heavenly Father, these bones are dry. I pray that you would give them life by your word and spirit. That these words would not be to us as dead letters on a page, as something as, as common as a John Grisham book. But they would be to us the authoritative words of our Heavenly Father that speak life. Father, let us enjoy that life by your Spirit. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Church, we're in Ezekiel chapter 37. Let's pick up in verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews upon them, and the flesh came upon them, and the skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, so that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you. And you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word this morning. 
When I attended Mississippi State for landscape architecture, I took a class on trees. Fascinating, isn't it? And the way the teacher taught the class is he would take us on, on trips throughout campus and we would look and label and name every tree. It was like show and tell. I see very much our passage today is a divine show and tell. God had something to show Ezekiel. And as much as I want to think of this passage as a visionary experience, I do not want any of us to think of it as a unique experience. It's not, is it? Have you seen a valley of dry bones? Have you seen a valley of dry bones? The hallmarks are always the same. A valley of dry bones is a deaf valley. It's deaf. They have no ears to hear. In the very call of Ezekiel, God says it would have been more preferable for Ezekiel to serve the Lord in a foreign nation with a foreign tongue than to serve God in Israel. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. If the Lord were to appear in this place and say, who will go for me? And Brandon says, I'll go, but send me, send me somewhere easy. And God sends him to the bush in the middle of the Congo, sleeping in a mud hut to people who speak a different language. He might be a little confused, wouldn't he? What makes Ezekiel's ministry to Israel so hard? Well, God tells him, the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, for they are not willing to listen to me, because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. It doesn't matter that you speak the same tongue, that you grew up in the same community, that you experience the same things. At the end of the day, they have no ears to hear. They won't listen. It's frustrating, isn't it? It's amazing to me how many pastors describe challenging the challenges of ministry in the South in the exact same way. Because in the South, if you've got two legs and you're upright, you're a Christian. And yet, so many are deaf to Christ's words. It's a deaf valley. But besides being a deaf valley, a dry valley is also a dull valley. Now I don't mean dull as in dumb. I mean dull as in terms of their appetite. They have no desire for the things of God. Jesus describes a blessed life as those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That does not describe this valley. Now hear me, they, it's not that they have an absence of desire. They have plenty of desire, just in the wrong places. Paul describes them as those who follow the passions of their flesh. Not good. Amos describes them as those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their fine leather couches. They drink wine from their bowls. They sing idle songs, they anoint their heads with oil, but they are not grieved over the ruin of their people. Or if I could put a little southern spin on Amos. They drink a cold beer and they have a good time, but they could care less about the dry bones in the valley. They're dull. This is a far cry from Psalm 42 where he says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. There's no desire. I'm beginning the year by reading the diary and journals of David Brainerd. David Brainerd recounts being among the Indians. He was a, a missionary to the Native Americans in the 1740s. He recounts being among the Indians when two Dutchmen came. And they stayed one Sunday, and they, they worshiped together. But they were staying in the same teepee. 
or in neighboring teepees. And all day and all night, David Brainerd heard them discussing the prices of cotton in the markets and the political news of the day and the gossip from back home and all these worldly things. And David Brainerd writes in his diary, this must be what hell is like. David heard the dullness in the valley. Lastly, it's a deaf valley, it's a dull valley, but it's a dead valley. D-E-A, dead, dead as a doornail. It's not a flesh wound, it's not a sickness, Severed from God, they have no life in themselves. They are dead. The wind, that beautiful image of the Holy Spirit, does not blow in this valley, but the wrath of God shines upon them like the hot sun. But this is a question I have. Who is Ezekiel prophesying to in this passage? Who are the bones in the dry valley? Well, it's not the world. It's not the people out there. It's not the liberals or the right-wingers. It's not the druggies or the drunks. It's not the sexual deviant or the woke. It's these people right here. He says it himself. These bones are the house of of Israel. Our confession says it like this. This is the church under age. To them belong the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the law and the worship and the promises and according to the flesh Jesus Christ. This is a valley of dry bones. And unless we begin to think that a few centuries spares us from the same accusations Christ repeats it again in Revelation chapter 3 to the church at Sardis. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive. But you're dead. You're deaf. You're dull. You're dead. Do we not feel it? Do we not feel it in our own hearts as we reflect back on 2023, how many hours we squandered in worldly pleasures that give us no life, hours that we could have spent with Jesus Christ that went poof, the days of devotion not given, the obedience not rendered, the promises we made to God and the resolutions we gave him all for naught? Do we not feel the grief and the sorrow and the hardship that dried our bones one tear at a time? Surely I am not alone here in feeling a great sense of dryness in my heart and dryness in the church as we look around this country. We are dry. But then we ask the same question that God asked Ezekiel. Can these dry bones live? Can these, can these dry bones live? And I love how Ezekiel answers it. You know, Lord, great answer. What's the answer? Well, let's look at our passage. Right in the very first verse, what does it say? The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. In the Old Testament, you cannot touch a dead body. You would be unclean. And yet that's exactly where the Lord set him. And he said to him, prophesy. Preach to them. And he did as he was commanded. Is that not a picture of us, of what we have of Jesus Christ? Matthew chapter 1, conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. 
He was born into a valley of dry bones. In Matthew chapter 3, he was baptized and anointed, and the Holy Spirit abided with him. And what did he do after that? Repent and believe, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He prophesied to the dry bones. When he went to the temple or to the synagogue in Nazareth, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to set the captives at liberty, to heal the broken, to preach the good news to the poor. The Spirit was upon him and he prophesied just as his Father commanded him. And do we not see this over and over in Scripture? Peter says, you have the words of life. Romans chapter 10, faith, that which, which unites us to Jesus Christ, that faith comes through hearing him, through the preaching of the word. There is in us a necessity to have and to hear and to treasure God's word for ourselves. It is the voice of God who brings life to the dead. For that reason, Horatius Bonar says, we must know God's word, not from the report of others, but from our own experience, or else our life will be but an imitation our religion second-hand and second-rate. It will be of no more use than a skeleton in med school. Useless. You can put a coat on it. You can give it a name. You can play with it. Useless. We have a necessity today. Christ has come to bring life to us. His words give life. He, was, he watered that dry valley with his tears in the Garden of Gethsemane. He fertilized it with his blood in Golgotha. He has given his life that we may have life from the dead. I tell you this morning, I'm using the word life on purpose. I don't mean a new routine. I don't mean a new schedule. I don't mean new habits. All of those are great. I love it. That's why there's Bible reading plans. When you leave the church today, great. But Jesus didn't come to give us a new routine. He came to give us a new life. We desperately need that life that comes from his word. This is why the motto of our children's Sunday school our foundations for theology is that it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. This is why our children will go through the entirety of the Bible, except Song of Solomon, between kindergarten and sixth grade, because it, their life requires the whole Bible. What of us? Do we not have greater things in life which sap the life out of us? Do we not live with greater darts being thrown by Satan? Do we not have greater baggage and sin problems? Do we not face a world of grief and hard providences that our children will never know we walk through? How much more do we need Jesus Christ to speak life to us? There is no reason if we want to see these dry bones live that our Sunday schools should not be full to overflowing. Our Wednesday nights as we open the word full to overflowing. Our men's Bible study full to overflowing so we can see every opportunity for Christ to speak life into us. Our Bible should not remain dormant on our nightstand. We need the word that refreshes our life, that enlightens our eyes, that makes wise the simple and rejoices the heart. 
it is that important. God brought Jesus Christ to give us life. And only the word of God can equip the man of God to be perfect in every way. But besides the word of God, we need the spirit of God. Notice what he says. He says, you call upon where he says breath, that can also be translated spirit. Prophesy to the spirits. Come, breathe on these slain that they may live. And then he says, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you within your own land. There is a desperate need in our day and age for the work of the Holy Spirit. Every good thing we do is a byproduct of his influence on us. We see it in our passage. Is this not the redoing of what we saw in Genesis 1 where God took the dry ground and he breathed into it by the Holy Spirit and he became a living soul. John chapter 6 again says, The flesh availeth nothing. It is the spirit that gives life. We have a desperate need for the work of the Holy Spirit in, this, in our lives, in the life of our church, and the church abroad. Do you feel it? Do you feel it? Do you grow weary? Do you grow weary of having no hunger for the things of God? Knowing you should be following him, knowing what you ought to do and you have no hunger. Do you grow weary with reading God's word and as soon as you shut the Bible, it's, it's gone. Isn't that amazing? I have a friend that can tell you the football scores of an old Miss game from 10 years ago, but probably can't tell you what we read yesterday in the Bible. That's how our flesh works. How desperately we need the Holy Spirit. Do we long for these dry bones to stand on two feet and be obedient to the Lord? It is the Spirit that writes His word on our hearts and strengthens us for godly obedience. We have a need today for the Holy Spirit. This summer, as we spend a summer in systematics, we'll spend 11 weeks on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. It seems like since the charismatic movement, you just don't talk about the Holy Spirit anymore. That's what them crazy folks do. We don't do that here. He gives us life. He sanctifies us. He restores us. He helps us cry out in prayer. We need the Holy Spirit. For that reason, every Wednesday night as we finish studying the Bible, we will pray for an outpouring of God's Spirit. Our men's prayer breakfast should be full of, of full bellies and hearts lifted up as we cry out for the Holy Spirit to be poured out afresh in this generation. We have seen it. Many of us here come to faith under the days of Billy Graham when it seemed as if there was a fresh point out of the Holy Spirit. We read the days of the Great Awakening of the Holy Spirit being poured out afresh. Is that something we're longing for today? We cannot live, we cannot move, we cannot have our being apart from the Holy Spirit. Are we lifting up our sails to catch the wind? Are we lifting up our prayers to God and asking for his divine assistance? Church, do we long to see these dry bones live? Do we long? Do we long for times to come of refreshing to the valley? We pray so often that revival would happen out there. And I want to see it. But can I tell you something? The light doesn't shine brighter because the world gets darker. The world's dark enough, isn't it? The light shines brighter because it's got more fuel to it. Do we want to see the dry bones live? 
We cannot ask God today to do great things out there if we are not willing to see the dry bones live in here. Would you pray with me throughout the course of 2024 that we would be a people animated by word and spirit that we may see this become another green valley. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, I pray for myself that there is much dryness, worldly pleasures which suck out all love for Jesus Christ, vain and vanity, vain conversations which distract our hearts from Jesus Christ everywhere we turn life is being sucked out of us Lord I pray that you would grant us new life here for all the dry and barren spots in our hearts and our life I pray that would be the place where the Holy Spirit would be poured out in power that this church may continue to grow in life and holiness more than we did years past. That we may see more families as fathers and mothers read the word and raise their children in godly ways. So we hear more voices come together to cry out for the salvation of our children and grandchildren and the lost in our families and community. Pray your spirit be poured out that we may have more opportunities to serve and further your kingdom, that we may grow in love for, your, for you and for yours. Lord, create in us a soul-hungering thirst and hunger for the bread of life. That is our humble plea. We ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, we're going to...